Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for that great name. Not only that great name, Lord, we want to live out our lives, Lord, sharing that great name. You give us another day of life, Lord, commissioned to share the gospel message, the good news. I pray for the families that are here today, those who are going to be watching in the future or currently. I just thank you, Lord, that you continue to be in the center of their lives. May you mold us, shape us, and continue to guide our every step. And it's in that great name we all say, Amen. Well, good morning, church family. Hey, as usual, we're still doing COVID. Uh, let's do some holy waves to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, in front of you, on the side of you, and behind you. Now, for some reason, my notes are not pulling up. Yeah. No, 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 no. Can't wing that. <laughs> but I do have a few announcements. Um, uh, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, um, my name is uh, Pastor Victor. It's a, a great opportunity to continue to lead Calvary Chapel Mountain Center. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All, all the way, for sure. But, uh, and it's still not opening. Mm. <laughs> but I do want to uh, share uh, next Sunday, uh, would like to meet with our elders, with our leaders, our volunteers, those uh, men and women who have been faithfully serving uh, this church in whatever capacity, whether it's uh, housekeeping, whether it's uh, greeting, um, children's ministry, um, hospitality, whatever, however the Lord has been using you to continue to share God's message and to be a faithful servant with this property that the Lord has blessed each and every one of us. Uh, we'll like to sit with you guys uh, after service um, briefly, 30 minutes. I will time myself so we will not take uh, longer than that. Um, and those who've been here for longer than six months, um, if you're interested in uh, the vision, uh, being in prayer for Calvary Chapel Mountain Center, I think it's important uh, that we're all on the same page moving forward. So definitely encourage you guys to stay behind next Sunday after service. And I will make service a little shorter, that way we can, you know, enjoy our fellowship with one another and the reason why is because starting March I think it's time to uh, pay attention to our littles yes. uh, it's important that we start focusing on 2021 moving forward in the name of the Lord uh, we have these special gifts that uh, we see here with us uh, and we need to we need to minister to them and we also need to uh, start looking forward to youth uh, as well as upcoming events. Um, again, we have a beautiful property that needs to be used to give honor and glory to the Lord. And you're still not turning on. <laughs> Let me see another route here. I got the Bible. Come on, Lord. So we're traveling through 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to continue where we left off uh, from last week, uh, which is 12 through 14. I'm going to condense that version. And then from 15 through 17, and then we'll tie that message uh, up in closing. Okay. I'm going to pray one more time because this is uh, definitely needed. <laughs> Father God, you know uh, this morning is to uh, give you honor and glory. Uh, it's not about uh, 
self-image or the notion that there's chocolates and roses waiting for us in our hospitality room or any type of goodies for this day. We want to give you honor. We want to give you glory. And I pray, Father God, that uh, the reflection of this message and those who are uh, willing to hear your word, Lord, uh, impacts, Lord, mightily for, for all of us, Lord. We thank you again as all the particulars from the sound and um, worship and media, Lord, and technology, Lord. This is to give you honor and glory. And we do thank you again for all that you have done and are doing. And it's in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I got a window open. I see a lot of things running. That's why. I'm sorry, guys. And I want to share a little kind of cool um, uh, little insight. So when my wife came up, and started to hear uh, me teach. Um, she uses a Bible that has basically a, a large section of notes, and so she's writing along. But her Bible uh, is pretty much filled up from our previous pastor. And so uh, kind of tagging on to our teachings, there's nowhere to write. And so uh, she went online to, uh, and got a new Bible, and so we're actually going to be journeying, journaling commentary and journeying through this uh, time together as me, the lead pastor of not only the church, but also my wife. And so she's writing her notes. So it's really kind of a cool thing. I, I don't know if you guys can could put together, but it's just pretty awesome and uh, definitely a humbling experience and seeing that has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with the Lord. So here's a little bit of background. So we have been traveling through chapter 1 of John's first epistle. And we have learned that from the beginning, God wants to establish fellowship with us. We have learned that through the vertical relationship, the koinonia, partnership, that it builds... Our relationships with our Heavenly Father and that our joy may be full then as we jump right into chapter 2 we discovered that our Heavenly Father does not want us to sin and then John goes on to explain that when uh, the world is trying to influence us we are to focus on the Lord and then we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who not only takes away our sins, but the sins for the whole world as well. You know, John repeats the importance of walking in the light and not in darkness. Then he goes on to say we can't love God, but then hate our brothers or those who wronged us who hurt us, who disagree with us. Why is that so important? Because it's a heart issue that prevents us from having the right attitude to walk according to God's will. Now, church, I totally get the difficulties with this part. So don't think I'm up here expecting you to invite those who disagree with you over for s'mores and be singing kumbaya, my lord. <laughs> I also understand that it's not an invitation to invite those who have wronged you mentally, physically, emotionally over for dinner because we are to show love, John says. That won't go well. I know that. I understand that. However, through Christ, there is an expected restoration. There is a reconciliation. There is forgiveness. 
whether we have been given the apologies or not, we no longer are burdened with those things, no longer separate us from our relationship with the Father, no longer harboring hatred in our hearts because we are abiding in the Lord. Ask any seasoned brother and sister in Christ and say, is it possible to have that uh, hardened heart? Or is it possible to carry those burdens in your walk? And they will tell you, it is difficult, but it's not possible to continue to hold on to those things as I walk faithfully with Christ. Because they do know why. It is not possible to serve Christ and think like the world. Brother John will share more with us about that in verses 15 through 17. But let's get into God's Word, starting in verses 12 through 14. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. And it reads, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for you. For you, for his namesake, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. I'm going to uh, condense this version of 12 to 14 because I want to spend more time in the closing scriptures. And so John writes to little children, fathers, and young men. Now this portion of John's uh, letter has a tone that the readers are Christians. Verse 12 says their sins are forgiven for his namesake. So there is a connection, there is a relationship, an understanding. And then it says, Fathers have known him who is from the beginning. And the young men have overcome the wicked one. So the image I get from these short verses is our elder, Senior John, Grandpa John of the faith who is gathering the family of Christians, bringing, him every, bringing everybody in. He's, he's got something to share. His connection is for the spiritual state of mind, for the family of Christ. And as a reminder for them to carry on that attitude out into the world. Little children, they have a job. They are to listen, to soak in God's Word. Fathers and young men, this portion of John's letter, again, is giving us uh, uh, that responsibility. We're the examples. Ladies, uh, don't feel left out, but you're also encouraged as well. You are a part of the Lord's army. And with this family that I see here in front of me this morning, we're a blended family. We are to be uh, focusing on the Lord as He guides our every day. His concern again for us is to have a spiritual state of mind. So we can go out in that attitude, reflecting that into our worlds. I'll write this down, family. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to 31. On your own time, your own devotions with the Lord, read those scriptures and you will see the type of dynamic, the type of family God is calling all of us to be a part of. I'm going to paraphrase though. We are many members who have many roles in being 
the representation of Christ. Not just here, but everywhere. Our attitude, actions, and our affections must display that. There is no one-man show here or one-woman parade. We are all needed as a body of believers as we journey through life together. A revival begins not in the state house or the White House, but in the church house, yes. in your house, and in my house. All these individuals that John is writing believe to be a part of God's family. So they are being raised up knowing about the character of Christ and encouraged to display this first for themselves, marriages, family, and in our churches and outward. And that's the same way I believe. That's the order. It's for us first. Our marriages, and then into our families, and then into our churches, and then outward. The reason is we can't be used effectively if our walk isn't right. If we can't display love effectively with our spouses, then we can't be used effectively to show love to others. If we can't expect revival in our homes, then that means there is not order in our homes. And, and as our ministry as of a church, if there is no fruit, to be produced, then there is no effectiveness in our message. You know, God wants the spiritual fruits, not religious nuts. <laughs> now that's where my notes stop. <laughs> I definitely don't want to end on that note right there. <laughs> I tell you guys the story of why I went electronic? <laughs> so the story was uh, my senior pastor, he went Apple, and uh, he had this fancy tablet. And then our intern pastor um, got a tablet. And I was the oddball pastor who had paper, and I would just go through my papers. And uh, confidently, not, you know, worrying about this kind of stuff, and... They went on every service without any issues. A single issue. Years went by. Months went by. And so I, you know what? You know, let me just go ahead and invest. And lo and behold, I wish I had my papers. I followed my notes. God wants spiritual fruits and not religious nuts. Let's keep reading verses 15 through 17. Thank you, Lord. Uh, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it, 
but he who does the will of God abides forever. Do not love the world. You know, John has told us that if we walk in sin's darkness and claim to be in fellowship with God, we are lying. Remember that? Yet John points out a specific area of sin that especially threatens our fellowship with God. To love worldliness. One of the first examples of this idea of the world or world system is found in Genesis 11. It speaks of a human society's rebellion against God at the Tower of Babel. Well, the Tower of Babel, uh, there was an anti-God leader of humanity whose name was Nimrod. There was an organized rebellion against God, and it was direct distrust of God's word and promises. And so the construction was to build this tower to protect against a future flood from heaven. The whole story of the Tower of Babel also shows us another perspective of the world system. The world's progress, technology, government, and organization can make man better off, but not better. Because we have a natural tendency of looking for the easy, better, faster way in things. With constant productions of new things, it is so easy to fall in love with the world and its system. And the story of the Tower again of Babel shows us that world system. As impressive and promising as it is, in a way it appeared, but it will never outlast the Lord. The Lord defeated the rebellion at the Tower of Babel easily. Warren Wiersbe says, worldliness is not so much a, a matter of activity as of attitude. He goes on to express that worldliness, or the love of it, is a matter of the heart. This, we see that John is sharing with us to pay attention to. We are not to love either the world's perspective or its ways of doing things. There is a secular, anti-God way of doing things that compromises our Christian walk. Again, this letter that is written by Brother John, again, he knew that the readers were believers and wanted to remind them of their roles so, if we want to know more as the defined uh, areas in our lives that are worldly, that gray and white area some people kind of struggle with, is this, you know, me compromising or is this me being part of the world? You know, really be in prayer. Everybody deals with each differently. No, but here's some things I want you to be thinking about when you're dealing with those worldliness. Line them up with this. If God was sitting, walking, listening, watching those things with you, while being there in His presence, would you be convicted? Would He say, bro, come on, don't do that. Daughter, I died for that very thing. Whatever worldliness we might be involved in or a part of, if it brings conviction, then there is a possibility it is wrong. If you're still not sure, again, believe me, we are going to go through it in God's Word, and He will line it up according to to where we are in life. Now, how does the world display love? What a perfect example today, right? 
today is that example that the world is basically displaying love. This love is ex of a, an expression of time, attention, and expenses or materialism. Now, I'm not trying to get us guys out of buying roses and chocolates. Well, look, honey, the pastor said it's materialism. We can't do that stuff. So, you know, uh, I love you and that should, you know, be it. But I'm not saying that for us guys or gals for us to be receiving them as well. Okay. But I do want to bring again what John is sharing. We need to have an understanding if you love the world, there are rewards by prestige, status, honor, and many comforts. The world knows how to temporarily reward its lovers. And the world has its ruler, again, Satan, who is also seeking whom he may devour. At the same time, even at their best, the rewards last only as long as we live. We need to pay attention here, church, because the, these, uh, these things, there, there's other things that are basically sneaking in. You know, when we are receiving that status or that honor or the comforts of the world, we do lose that perspective. In the connection of prestige, status, honor, and our comfort of heaven. When we are only focused, again, on those things of the world and not on the things above. By loving the world and the things in the world embraces the temporal which separates us from the eternal. That temporal distances us from the divine. Like always, the Spirit does use scriptures, use worship, use prayer, introductions. So I want to remind us, when I'm going to go down a, a memory lane here for many of us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it reads, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is Satan. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you and I have been saved. Amen? Amen. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Simply those who love the world are incompatible to love the Father. They might spend the money that says, in God we trust, but have written in their hearts, me first. Remember when we talked about serving two masters, it's impossible. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, materials and so forth. Through the centuries, Christians have dealt with the magnetic pull of the world in different ways. At one time, it was thought that if you were really committed Christians and really wanted to love God instead of the world, you would leave human society and live in a, as a monk or as a nun out in a desolate monastery. You might have heard this story 
but I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, the story of the one man who joined the monastery for the same reason. I need to separate from the world. I need to connect to the Lord. And this is how I'm going to do it. So he arrives to uh, the monastery and he, he is embraced. And he's all jazzed like, this is, this is where I need to be. I don't want the world anymore. I want to be closer to God. And the, the, the monastery leader says, okay, you'll, there's one rule and uh, there's an attachment to that rule. You cannot speak. No problem. Spend time with the Lord. In silence. Sure. At the end of the year, you can speak. When you speak, be two words. Awesome. Sign me up. A year goes by. And that man goes to the monastery leader. And he's given uh, that opportunity to share his first two words. Which are? Hard bed. That year goes on, and he continues to spend time in the Lord. And that year it turns into two, and he's given the opportunity to share his two words. And he says, "Bad food." <laughs> Another year goes by, three, and he's trying to spend time with the Lord, and he's given the opportunity to speak at the end of year number three which is his last two words. And he says, I quit. <laughs> the monastery leader responds, about time, all you've done since you've got here is just complain, complain, complain. <laughs> the love of the world and the things of the world are no different. We will never be satisfied. Let me read verse 16 again. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You guys might remember Genesis 36 gave us the basic same inscriptions here that we read. For these three actions was our fall. Mankind and woman from grace. Genesis, it says, Eve saw it was good for food, flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. The tree desirable to make one wise, pride of life. That monk attempted to be disconnected from the world, but what he didn't know was that. He brought the world with him into the monastery. Now, there's another perspective we need to understand with Jesus, who has intended us to be in the world, but not of the world. We see this in his prayer for his disciples to the Father. And it isn't any different for us today. Look at John chapter 17, verses 13 and 18. I'm going to read it from the overhead. Do we have that? John 17, 13 through 18. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus interceding to our Heavenly Father for the disciples then and the disciples that are in front of me now. No different. God knows we have eyes and that the appearance means a lot to us. He made a beautiful world to please us. But God wants us to look beyond the outward appearances of the flesh and to the inward workings of of the heart. It's also not in God's nature to influence us through the lust of the eyes. We all know that. God knows we have emotional, 
psychological needs, to be wanted, to be loved, and to be given security. He made us this way, but He doesn't leave us this way. That was his prayer to the Father for us in John. To give us more clarity, church. Jesus spent 30 years preparing for his three years of ministry. Not just to fulfill prophecy, but to fulfill all of our needs. Jesus loves I always uh, share that illustration with the kids. Do you know how much Jesus loves you? How much? How much? This much. Is what I'm living for worth Christ dying for? In preparing for this message, it did occur to me that this here mountaintop living for many is to be separate from the lights the glam, the hustle and bustle. But up here, we can get caught up in the pride of life. I'm a local. Oh, I don't want anything to do with them tourists, them flatlanders. <laughs> I don't want any dealing again with them or uh, telling them how to drive <laughs> in the snow with no chains. <laughs> In a Honda? <laughs> or I'm up here to isolate from folks. Some are focused on the preservation and the beauty of creation and not of the Creator. When we are able to reflect on life or the world, let us measure our thoughts to see if they follow more the world or of our Heavenly Father. What is your standard for success? Is it worldly or godly? Think of your standard for what makes a person, man or woman, attractive or appealing. Is it worldly standard or a godly standard? Think of your standard of love. Is it worldly love? Or is it a godly love? This is how great our need is. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We all heard these scriptures. We know these scriptures. And we should know how important it is. To not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of of your mind. Verse 17. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. It is not a prayer, not a wish, and not a spiritual uh, sounding desire. This is a fact. It is passing away. And not only is the world passing away, but we are passing away. Each and every day, we are living to die, or are we dying to live? We should remember that the ancient pharaohs were buried in their pyramids with all sorts of riches, which were thought to be some sort of use for them in the next world. Just to discover that the only ones that benefited were the grave robbers. The pharaohs could take none of their worldly stuff with them to the world beyond. And so is the same image for us. No one is driving to heaven with a U-Haul. We're not entering those pearly gates with our earthly possessions. I thought that scene, again, every time I hear that, is, is pretty comedic. 
I can just imagine the individuals walking into heaven's gate with their golden hands. And I can hear Peter's quick response. Wow, look at this guy or gal. Their, uh, their thought or their description of value is basically what our streets are made of. Oh, man, these people. But all right, Lord, you know, you want them to come in. You let me in, by the way. But there is, again, that notion of building and, and storing up our treasures. We know where we should store our treasures. And we know how to store those treasures. Our attitude, our actions, and our affections here on earth. And again, it should be very familiar for us. Because we understand the definition of being a Christ follower. He who does the will of God abides forever. This stands out more promising compared to the passing world. We as believers know or are learning that this world isn't forever. And how cool again lining it up to the things that we do know that are forever. Those three things. Awesome for us to hear that. Awesome for us to be reminded by those things. We need to be doing the will of God. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. If we give time to God, pay attention to His Spirit, and receive sacrificially His love for us, we are on the path to receive, to receive eternal rewards. Not just for us, for those whosoever believes. That's why it's so important for us to share this good news. We have family members and friends who do not know the Lord. And as this world and ourselves are passing away, let us be responsible in sharing that message. If I can have our worship team, please come back up. Church, today is the day of love. But let us be the vital church who celebrates the love of Christ every day. Let's display uh, our Christ's love in our lives sacrificially, not selfishly. Let Christ's love reflect from us while we live in the world and not of it. Let us leave here showing and telling others that Christ so loved the world. Can you stand with me, please? I want to pray for my brothers and sisters who are here. That they know, that they know the Lord. And the love that he's given all of us. I pray for the individuals. I pray for the couples. I pray for the families. That you continue to guide them, Lord. Direct them in that love. And may they reflect that inward relationship outward towards the world. Those who might be needing prayer for whatever reason, we are definitely going to have those here to be uh, intercessors for you. But church, think about this image. A world, round world, cannot fit into a three-cornered heart. We have a great message for a dying world. What are you doing with that message? Let's worship.